my internet's down. So, if you guys are like me, chances are you're working from home. Which means you're, you know, at your house with a single internet connection and just like me, you're going to inevitably hit a snag where your primary internet fails. I had that happen yesterday. You know what good a firewall engineer and an IT professional is when their internet's down? I was basically knocked down a few peg holes to a conference call junkie. Anyways, while I was down and out and a little bit frustrated, I decided to do some research on previous videos that I'd done and what they covered and, you know, on as well as, you know, how to tackle this issue. And much to my surprise, I realized that pretty much the only video I have revolving around multiple WAN failover is a, uh, a video that specifically talks about a FortiGate cluster, an HA cluster, communicating with multiple ISPs. And I didn't even do a step-by-step -step on that one. So I figured I'd do you a solid and do a basic, I have a single FortiGate, but I have two ISPs, and one of them I only want to use for failover. So, keeping it simple, keeping it sweet, this is how you set up a FortiGate device so that WAN 1 will be your primary and WAN 2 will be your failover in the event that WAN 1 fails. Now, before we jump in, there's one thing to make sure you know, and that is this isn't the interface is physically down. This isn't a hard down. This is for situations where your interface is up. WAN 1 is showing green on the FortiGate. Like, let's say you're internal to the FortiGate and you decide to log into it. And when you log in, you see the network interface is up. Well, you know, usually in situations like that, if it's DHCP or whatever, and you have equal routes, et cetera, et cetera, it'll at least pull the route because the interface is up. But if that interface is up, it's going to keep it there, right? So the link monitor is going to test the interface as well. And in the event that it can't reach the server you define, that's when you'll get the actual failover that you desire. So, um, let's jump right in. Going to go ahead and start off by saying this is on a Forda Wi-Fi 61E that does not have a secondary internet connection. This is specifically so we can go through the actual process as far as the CLI goes. Um, I also want to make mention that this is on 6.4.0. Do not install it. Don't install it on a production unit. I'm warning you. It's GA. GA with Fortinet, I usually say it stands for generally ass. It's going to be buggy, right? Last thing you want to do is be the little tack guy on the phone's, you know, guinea pig. So, but I digress. Just don't install it. Anyways, so I'm going to log in to my uh, Forda Wi-Fi here, which is sitting on a counter behind me. You know, it's doing its best life. It's, it's helping me make videos to help give people some level of co comfort whenever they first dive into these things, right? So you look at my interfaces. If you already have a firewall that's in place, you might not have zones, which means your policy probably looks like LAN to WAN1, LAN to DMZ, etc., cetera, etc. Cetera. I like to keep my interface is configured using zones, it helps keep things simple from a policy standpoint. If it's an outside interface, WAN 1, WAN 2, I assign it to the outside zone. If it's an inside interface, LAN, Wi-Fi, whatever, I, ins I install it or you know place it within the inside zone. If it's a TMZ van line, VLAN, van line, I don't even know where that came from. If it's a DMZ VLAN, oh, DMZ zone, etc. That way, if you have a situation where you need to add multiple interfaces or maybe you're porting over your policy set to a new device later, what if your physical arrangement changes? You're kind of screwed into having to redo all those policies, right? Well, not so much with this because it's just inside to outside, outside to inside, inside to DMZ, etc. Um, Fortinet did come out with a, a way of giving a role to an interface. You know, you could say it's a DMZ or a LAN or or whatever, but to quote Lord of War, I prefer my way. So, whatever. I have an outside zone that has both WAN 1 and WAN 2, and then I have my inside zone that has my data, v data VLAN. So, groovy. We have what we need. Um, so, 
from there we jump in. You configure this on the CLI. This is not SD WAN. This is not, you know, Fortinet's SD WAN, you know, insert special effects here, which is what they market nonstop for, right? This is WAN link fell over. Primary LAN, WAN serves all functionality. And if it boogers up, let's jump on over to the WAN too, right? So, first things first is we go to config system link monitor. Link monitor, that's all you need. Config system link dash monitor. And then from there you can do a get. I don't have any installed yet. Since my primary internet link is the one I'm wanting to monitor, I'm going to edit. And then I'm going to title this thing WAN1. Keep it simple. As I like to do with all of my firewall configurations, keep it simple. That way, if you step off a cliff, or you need to hire new help, or whatever, any engineer can really jump in here and kind of, you know, make heads and tails of what's what. So, edit WAN1, that creates the link monitor titled WAN1, and this is where we have our list of information that we can actually set. So. We're sitting here, name, WAN1. It's monitoring the WAN1 interface. Address mode, you have two options here. You can do IPv4 or you can do IPv6. Stick with V4, most of you probably will. If you're in a situation where you're doing IPv6, more power to you. Most of the US is fairly lagged behind from a network architecture standpoint with their actual implementation of it. Not to mention the engineers themselves just don't get it yet. Source interface, this is the interface you wish to test from. If I'm wanting to watch the connectivity of WAN1, my source interface is going to be WAN1. So, you know, if you're on a FortiGate and your WAN1 connection is port 1, then your source interface would be port 1. For server, this is what you wish to actually test connectivity to. I almost always use Google. It very seldom has any kind of issues, very reliable, and your pings aren't going to concern them. They get hit with tons of traffic all the time. Protocol is ping, because I'm using the ping protocol to test connectivity. You do have other options there, like uh, TCP echo, UDP echo, HTTP GET, and uh, TWAMP. So, you know, echo link monitors, HTTP gets is just changing the way it's testing the connectivity, right? So we have our source interface, we have our server set. Now we need to look at things like our interval and our timeout record. Interval is how many milliseconds it's going to test. Every 500 milliseconds out of the box, this device, whenever you set up a link monitor, is going to go, hey, you there? Hey, you there? Hey, you there? And it's going to keep doing it and keep doing it. The probe timeout is how long it's going to wait on that probe to come back before it considers it lost. Which means every 500 milliseconds it's going to send a test and if it doesn't get a response to that test within 500 milliseconds, that was a failure. And then fail time and recovery time, these two options right here. Fail time is how many times in a row a probe needs to fail in order for it to pull the route, which is referenced here. Update cascade interface, update static route. You know, does it pull the information related to that interface if it fails enough times? Recovery time is the same exact thing. It's going to be successful five times in a row in succession, not, oh, I've worked here, didn't work there, worked two times, didn't work there. Not a crappy line, five in a row. And once it hits five in a row of successful uh, connection attempts, it'll reinstall that uh, route. Status is enabled, HA priority is one. So, you know, that's how you do it. That's pretty much your interface, right? So you can go to next. And then you can do a get, and then you see it there. WAN1 is the one I created, and then you do a show, you can actually see the parameters that were configured. I keep it very, very simple. Gateway IP and source IP, it'll use whatever set for that interface if you leave it on quad zero. But if you wanted it to take another path or do with something else, you have that capability. I like this a lot from the standpoint that it does a very good job of making sure 
Uh, if the interface is physically up, but is still experiencing connectivity issues, you're okay, right? So, that's good. And then you come in here and you look under um, logging and reporting under events, system events up here in the top right. Link monitor initial state is alive using protocol ping. And if I were to, you know, pull that out and make it to where it couldn't get the quad eight on my upstream firewall, this would, you would see it get pulled down and accordingly. So, that is how you do link monitoring. There are a few things to consider though. One, you need to have two upstream connections to whatever you're trying to test link monitoring to. Two, it doesn't have to be limited to WAN. If you have multiple paths to anything, you can use this. So if you have multiple internal paths, let's say your firewall is on slash 30 between um, switch one and it has another slash 30 between it and switch two, so you have a, a redundant path there, you can use it there as well. So um, you got a lot of flexibility with that regard. Number two, it's going to use the device and the route it, that has priority. So if you have two routes that have an administrative distance of 10, but one has a priority of 20, the one with the lower priority is going to get preference. Priority on a Florida gate is like cost on a Cisco device. So usually in situations like this, you want WAN 1 and WAN 2 to have the same AD, administrative distance, and the WAN 2 to have a higher priority, that way it doesn't get preference. Or, you know, no, that's pretty much what you want to do, right? And same thing for anything that has multiple routes. Anything a FortiGate does, FortiNet follows RFC to AT. So anything FortiGate does is going to follow RFC. It's going to follow the route table to know which path to take. So just pay attention to that and you're on your way. That's a simple layout on how to make it to where if your primary internet has an issue, it'll pull that route and start using your secondary. Obviously this isn't going to be the most useful situation for organizations that have public IP space and they're looking at you know, self-hosting servers. When you get to that point, just go ahead and order you an IP block and start doing BGP. So, I mean, if you want to do it right, do it right, right? So, um, otherwise you have to deal with multiple VIBs and multiple MX records and A records and all that stuff to get your stuff jiving the way you want it to and that's just a pain in the butt. So, that's how you do it. If you have any questions, hit them up in the comments below. I'll be more than happy to answer them. If I did a poor job elaborating on anything, just let me know. And uh, I will, you know, make edits and add to it. So, if you have questions, hit me up. More than happy to answer them. Otherwise, you guys have a great day, and you let me know if you need anything. Thank you.